This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the number one daily fantasy sports app. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 597. Welcome in. I want to share a little story real quick. I think I made a new friend this weekend. I met a guy, listener of the show, Joel. He uh, he was a stranger. I gave him my address. He picked me up. Didn't kill me. Hallelujah. Uh, he drove me. We went to Kahuku, Hawaii to watch a football game, high school football. Kahuku beat Campbell. It was awesome. It was a lifelong dream of mine to go watch a game in Kahuku. If you're not sure who they are, Google Kahuku football. They are a legendary program that sends guys to the NFL and college football constantly. And like a little tiny town, and it was so much fun. And uh, Joel, if you're out there listening, good to meet you, man. I, I I straight up, I'm telling you the audience, I think Joel and I became friends. I think we're going to hang out again and go to more games. And, um, you know, I was had this moment, like almost like going on a first date. You like hang out with a friend for the first time. You're like, are they going to text me back? Like, are, are we going to hang out again? And he did text me back today. It was kind of fun. I was like, oh, yes. Okay. I got a new friend on the island. Hallelujah. That was pretty cool. He was texting me about how his fantasy team was horrible today. Uh, kind of funny. He had Jonathan Taylor. Uh, I was glad I had Zach, uh, Zach Moss. So I had the Colts running back who did really well today. He had the one who did nothing today. Um, I want to take a short break. I know it's weird to start the show, but I, I'm supposed to do ad breaks earlier in the show. So um, we got to take a break right now because we got to pay the Patriots. Prize Picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app. Prize Picks allows you to make an entry based on player projections, and in 60 seconds, you could enter something like Travis Kelsey more than five catches, Tyreek Hill more than 100 yards receiving, and Justin Fields less than 200 yards passing. And if your picks are right, you can win money. Making picks makes games more engaging, and you could turn something like $5 into 50. Prize Picks offers quick and easy deposits. You can even use Apple Pay. And they have weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts. For example, there's a weekly event called Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. So put your skills to the test in daily fantasy. Go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash CLNS, code CLNS, for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy made easy. All right, we are back. I want to talk about a game that, uh, oh man, Sunday night football was the game I was really, really looking forward to this weekend in the NFL. 49ers hosting the Dallas Cowboys. Two great defenses, two interesting quarterbacks, two head coaches calling plays on offense. And um, the 49ers dominated. The 49ers beat Dallas 42 to 10. Let me repeat that 42 to 10. It was not close. It was disappointing. I would call this disappointing. I wanted a good game. I wanted to not know who was going to win at the end of the game. And instead, we got Cooper Rush and Sam Darnold playing quarterback for most of the fourth quarter because the starters were out of the game. And uh, I wanted a good game. We didn't get that. I will say, though, I do want to admit this. If it was going to be a blowout, I'm very happy the team that won 42-10 to was the 49ers and Brock Purdy. I like watching Brock Purdy win. I like watching him do well. Um, it was wild. I was really curious which quarterback was going to play better, Dak Prescott or Brock Purdy. By far. Far, like by a wide, wide margin, Brock Purdy was the far better quarterback. Brock Purdy has still never lost a game during the NFL regular season. In fact, he's never lost a game he finished. Last year, he lost in the playoffs to Philadelphia. He got hurt. He left the game. We still technically have never seen Brock Purdy lose an NFL game, which is insane. He was the last pick of the seventh round. Brock Purdy was 17 for 24 passing against Dallas at 252 yards. Four touchdown passes, zero turnovers, and uh, he wasn't just throwing little tiny passes underneath screen passes. No, he was throwing the ball deep downfield, making big time throws. He had a beautiful, beautiful throw to Debo Samuel, deep over the middle. Um, I just can't say enough good things about Brock Purdy. He is probably this generation's Tom Brady, meaning that he's a player who knows what his strengths are. He knows what his weaknesses are. 
He's maximizing everything he does well and can do well. He's getting the most out of himself. Um, he's very self-aware of what his skill set is. He's like, I, I can't run like Patrick Mahomes. I don't have the biggest arm, but what I can do is get the ball out quickly, make immaculate, really good decisions, be really accurate, have great timing. Everything that Brock Purdy can control, he does incredibly well. And I'm just blown away, man. It's so cool. I mean, I said this on the show the other day, like, I understand if you're a, a fan of an opposing team and you don't like Brock Purdy, you're not rooting for him. I understand if you're like, hey, I'm not sure how good he is because he's not Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen. Like, I understand all that. But what I don't understand is people who can't look at his story and just think he's amazing, man. He's the American dream. He's a guy who came out of nowhere, Mr. Irrelevant, and is destroying NFL defenses. He, the Dallas Cowboys defense is one of the best defenses in football. He dropped four touchdown passes on him. They won 42 to 10. And uh, right now, five games into the year, I want to see the 49ers in the Super Bowl. I want that story. I want to see Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, this incredible rising star, go to the Super Bowl. I don't care if they win or lose, but that would be so much fun to see that happen. And the Super Bowl I want is 49ers Dolphins. I want to see the 49ers play the Miami Dolphins. It just sounds like a lot of fun. Two offenses with star players everywhere. It would be really cool. I mean, I will actually, I will take 49ers. Kansas City would also be really interesting. Bit of a rematch there. No Jimmy Garoppolo. Maybe the 49ers can win without him now. They're, they're maybe more likely to beat Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl with Brock Purdy. But, man, I, I just can't say enough good things about the 49ers. They are unbelievable. And uh, Philly plays Dallas two times this year. It's hard to imagine a game where Philly beats Dallas 42 to 10. I, I just, when you're measuring who's the best team in the NFC, I don't know how anyone doesn't look at the 5-0 and San Francisco 49ers and go, that is the best team, maybe in all of football, but definitely in the NFC. And again, probably just in the NFL all around. Uh, in this game against Dallas, 49ers tight end George Kittle had a meager, only three catches for 67 yards, but all three catches were touchdown passes. And, uh, George Kittle had never had a three-touchdown game before. I want to add on a personal note, I just benched him in fantasy football, and of course, he has the game of his life. Very, very frustrating that the moment I decide to lose patience and take George Kittle out of my fantasy roster, he goes off and is insane. Um, I want to remind you something. I want to remind you of something. There is something that I have said before. Um, I said it in August. I've said it many, many times. I want to remind you in case you forgot or don't remember. It's not a debate. Dallas Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott is massively overpaid and very, very overrated. I, I don't understand why people defend him anymore. Uh, in this game, Dak Prescott was 14 for 24 passing at 153 yards, one touchdown, and not one, not two, but three interceptions in this game. And uh, hey, Dak Prescott, way to show up in a big moment, right when your team needs you. By the way, early on in the first quarter of this football game, the Cowboys defense was making plays, keeping their team in it. Uh, there was a moment where they stopped the 49ers deep in their own territory. Christian McCaffrey had a big run, would have set up first and goal, but they pulled the ball away and he fumbled. And I thought early on in this football game, the Dallas Cowboys defense did their end of the bargain. They held their own. They allowed their team, their offense to have opportunities. And unfortunately, Dak Prescott and the offense couldn't help his defense in any points. Dak Prescott, to me... Was not a surprise that he was underwhelming, but he was very underwhelming in this football game. And all that money Dallas gave Dak Prescott, they've got nothing to show for it. They don't have a Super Bowl. They don't have a ton of... I mean, I, I don't know why people defend Dak Prescott. I don't understand it. Earlier in August... And by the way, Dak Prescott just got out pay, outplayed by a guy, Brock Purdy, making less than a million dollars this year. That's a shame. The guy making a ton of money had a horrible game. The guy who was the last pick of the draft, making less than a million dollars this year, made Dak Prescott look silly on national TV. That's an embarrassment. I said in August that the Cowboys will underachieve this year because of their coach and because of their quarterback. And that definitely was true in this game on Sunday night against the 49ers. The Cowboys had four total turnovers and... Uh, you know, I, I'm i out of energy to have the conversation about Dak Prescott. It's just clear to me. If you don't somehow understand that Dak Prescott ain't it, that he's overpaid, that he's overrated, that 
he's in the wrong position. I don't know what conversation you're having. Um, it, it's so many times I've waited to see. Maybe this is the game in the big moment where Dak Prescott shows up. I've been waiting for years, and it's never happened. So finally, once and for all again, Dak Prescott monumentally overpaid and massively overrated. It's worth noting uh, 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan, the play caller on the offensive side of the ball for the 49ers. He knows the Cowboys defensive coordinator really, really well. The defensive coordinator in Dallas is Dan Quinn. You might remember Dan Quinn and Kyle Shanahan because once upon a time, Dan Quinn was a head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, and Kyle Shanahan was his offensive coordinator when the Atlanta Falcons had a 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl and blew the lead. They lost to Tom Brady and the Patriots. Um, What I mean by that, the reason why I bring that up is to say that I have to wonder if that familiarity between Kyle Shanahan and Dan Quinn, how much did that help Kyle Shanahan? How many meetings did they have in strategy talking about their game plans, talking about their philosophies? It was clear to me that Kyle Shanahan knew Dan Quinn very well, had a great game plan. Uh, You have to wonder how much the familiarity really helped the 49ers offense in this football game. But again, um, it's worth saying, like, the first quarter of this game is kind of fun. It was 7 to nothing at the end of the first quarter. There were big hits. There was good defense. Uh, The atmosphere was incredible. Like, for the first quarter of this football game, I was like, oh, here we go. It's going to be awesome. But the 49ers just kept scoring and scoring and scoring, and the Cowboys just kept not scoring and turning over the football. And there was a moment in our our group chat uh, on the Strong Opinion Sports um, group chat. I I was like, Dak Prescott is monumentally, I said he's overrated and overpaid. And literally like the very next play, Dak threw an interception. It was first one of the game. He just hucks the ball deep into double coverage. No one's there. It's like, yep, there it is. Like, I just, I, I really wonder if you are still a Dak Prescott defender, what's your argument? Why, what's your reasoning to tell me that Dak Prescott's elite or amazing? I, at this point, I kind of believe anyone making that argument that's a Cowboys fan is just saying it because either they're so blinded by rose-tinted glasses, they're in denial of the truth, or they're just trolling. They're just trying to get a rise out of you. Because I don't know how anyone in their right mind can be happy with the way Dak Prescott has played the last couple of years, but especially not in this football game on the road in San Francisco. Man, uh, 49ers won by 32 points in a game that I was hoping would be close and fun. It was kind of fun watching the party for the 49ers as they celebrate four touchdowns for their quarterback, Brock Purdy. But it wasn't the game I wanted. You know, it's like, ah, man. And a lot of blowouts this weekend in the NFL. Blowout after blowout. Uh, It is worth noting, Cowboys linebacker Leighton Van Der Esch left the game injured. He has a neck injury. Um, I like Leighton Van Der Esch, man. He made a couple of really big plays, had a, a sack that's ingrained, or not a sack, a hit on Christian McCaffrey that's like ingrained in my mind where, dude, he lit up Christian McCaffrey. There's not a lot of guys that really get Christian McCaffrey in a bad spot where they tackle him and you're like, oh, whoa, that guy put him in his place. Leighton Van Der Esch did that in this football game. He's fantastic. I hope he's healthy and can play again soon. Um, it's just unfortunate. Leighton Van Der Esch is an awesome football player. Went to Boise State and uh, I am rooting for his health. Hope he's good at the end of, uh, hope hope he ends up okay. Now, I want to talk about another thing we saw that was, I would call the Cowboys' loss horrifying, losing by 33 on the road to Mr. Irrelevant. Um, We also, uh, we just saw another horrifying loss by the New England Patriots. The Saints beat the Patriots 34 to nothing. The Patriots are now 1-4. and And I would imagine Patriots fans right now, their confidence in their head coach, Bill Belichick, is at an all-time low. Like, I don't know what you're feeling if you're a Patriots fan. Please write in, let me know. How do you guys feel? I'm very curious. But since Tom Brady left to go to Tampa, Bill Belichick has done basically nothing. He got to a playoff game, so I would say almost nothing, but not quite totally nothing. But last week, we saw the Patriots lose to the Dallas Cowboys 38-3. to This week, we saw New England lose 34 to nothing to New Orleans. And uh, Patriots quarterback Mac Jones has six turnovers in the last two games. Three of those turnovers, two interceptions and a fumble, were, t- were returned for a touchdown. So he's not only having a lot of turnovers, he's literally handing opposing defenses touchdowns. 
Last week, Mac Jones had two interceptions and a fumble. Dallas returned the fumble for a touchdown, and one of the interceptions was a pick six. So Mac Jones handed Dallas two touchdowns last week. This week against New Orleans, again, Mac Jones had two interceptions and a fumble. One interception was also a pick six. And, uh, you know, Mac was hit as he threw. The ball came out like a wounded duck, just like fluttering everywhere. It didn't really go in any direction of a receiver. It's one of those plays where it's so obvious, take the sack. There's nothing open. Why are you forcing a throw into coverage? Just hold on to it, take the sack, live to see another day. Instead, he gets rid of the ball, gets caught, taken for a pick six. It's frustrating. And the fumble was a really bad play too, where the fumble was they get under center like they're going to run a quarterback sneak on third and short. They run a pitch to the running back. It's poor execution. The ball isn't pitched very well. Ball goes on the ground. It's a turnover. Technically a fumble on Mac Jones. Man, early in the fourth quarter, down 31 to nothing. Mac Jones got pulled out of the game. They put in Bailey Zappi at quarterback. I think next week Mac Jones is going to be the starting quarterback for the Patriots. I th- I think. I don't think he's benched forever. I will say, oddly enough, if the Patriots are going to bench Mac Jones, my recommendation this is a weird outside the box thought, but I would rather the Patriots play Malik Cunningham at quarterback than their backup Bailey Zappi. Malik Cunningham is an exciting, dynamic athlete. The dude can run. And if he's garbage, the Patriots are going to end up with a high first-round pick. Maybe they can draft Caleb Williams. I mean, if you're going to have a year where you're going to tank your season, I think Malik Cunningham is a really fun way to tank. I love that. It's a weird outside-the-box thought, but interesting to me. Um, The big question in New England right now is why is the Patriots' offense so bad? What's happening? Is it Mac Jones, the quarterback, or is it the playmakers around him? What's the problem with the offense in New England? I will say, like, there aren't a ton of explosive playmakers. They're not built like Miami, where they've got speed everywhere. Jalen Waddell, Tyreek Hill, now Chase Claypool, Devin Achain, Raheem Mostert. I mean, they've got weapons everywhere in Miami. It's not, they're not built like that. They're not even built like Buffalo. He's got, you know, Stephon Diggs, Dalton Kincaid, Gabe Davis. I mean... So I understand the argument that maybe Mac Jones could succeed in the NFL with better players around him. I understand where that's coming from because it's not like there's a ton of dynamic players on offense in New England. But I also want to remind you, Mac Jones always will have a low ceiling. At best, he's got an average arm. At best. He's also never going to be able to run around and make plays with his legs. And one thing that drives me nuts about Mac Jones, go watch the... The fumble he had where they're under center, they're on a pitch to the running back. His body language is horrible after bad stuff happens. There's both no fire, but there's also no poise. You got to pick one. Either be the passionate guy or be the calm, cool, collected guy. He's neither somehow. And you know, like comparing Mac Jones to Brock Purdy is wild because Brock Purdy is the exact same guy on a good play or a bad play. Even keel, there's no... Mopey sad. Oh, no, I'm so disappointed. I think Mac Jones handles failure badly. I don't like the body language you see when the stuff goes wrong for him. And when you look at the Patriots roster, this next comment might be out of pocket or a bit unfair. But as I look at the Patriots roster, it's one that Tom Brady would have won with. Hunter Henry and Mike Gusecki at tight end. At receiver, Juju Smith-Schuster, Kendrick Bourne, Devontae Parker, Demario Douglas, Kayshawn Booty, the running back, Ramondre Stevenson, Ezekiel Elliott. They've got an okay offensive line. There's not garbage in New England on the offensive side of the ball. There is no Tyree Kill. There is no Stephon Diggs. There is no explosive, crazy playmaker. But I do have a hard time looking at that roster. I have a hard time believing the players around Mac Jones are 100% the problem. I don't know, man. Um, I, I Like I said, I just, I can't in all good conscience look at the players in New England and say they're 100% the problem. There's enough playmakers. Hunter Henry's a good tight end. Mike gusecki has got an ability to go get jump balls. Kendrick Bourne's a speedy guy. Devontae Parker, Demario Douglas. Like there are playmakers or solid pros in New England. They're not, there's not garbage. Like Daniel Jones has a way worse offense around him than Patriots quarterback Mac Jones. No relation, by the way. The New England Patriots are in a really bad spot. They're 1-4. and four. 
The offense is a disaster. And I know it's a silly thought. I know this is ridiculous and weird. But I, I do love the idea of you know, Matthew Judon's injured. Christian Gonzalez is injured. Players on your defense aren't at 100%. So your, your first round pick, Christian Gonzalez, the corner's out. Matthew Judon, your pass rusher's out. You're one and four already. You don't need to win. You're not going to come back and make a playoff game. Why not put Malik Cunningham at quarterback? Have fun with it. Take him off the practice squad. And then hopefully you draft Caleb Williams next year. I, I know that's like an insane thing, but. What would this Patriots team look like with Caleb Williams next year? That one and four offense is abysmal. I don't know. I, if you're going to make a change at quarterback, I'm not saying they're going to. I, all I'm going to say is I know it's silly. I, you're not going to hear this from anyone else, and probably because it's insane. And and maybe I'm even half joking. I don't know. But I, I love the thought, the idea. Hey, if you're going to lose games and switch quarterbacks, put in the fun guy. Put in Malik Cunningham. He's going to run around and be messy but entertaining at minimum. And then if he's garbage, like I think he might be, you get a great quarterback in the draft next year. What's the harm in that? I just think that Malik Cunningham would be the most fun way to tank I've ever seen an NFL do, team do it. And uh, ah, it's, a, it's a weird thought, but what else are you going to lose? You're one and four. Year's over to me if you're in New England. And uh, Patriots fans, I want to hear from you. How do you feel about the team? How do you feel about Bill Belichick? Are people calling for his job? I would imagine there are people that want Bill Belichick fired. They're a... I, I, I love, I love, love, love the people of Boston and New England. They are harsh and fun and passionate. And despite the six Super Bowls Bill Belichick brought in, which I think to me gives him, he can lose for way more years than this year, and I'll, I'd still keep him there. He's just, he's earned the right to do whatever he wants. But I would imagine there are some Patriots fans out there that are like, get him out of there. We don't want Bill anymore. We want a, a new offensive coach who can win and um, you know maybe challenge the other good teams in our division. Notice, by the way, the Jets have a good defense. Miami's really good now. Buffalo's really good now. Tom Brady got out at the right time. Tom Brady, the years Tom Brady was in New England, their division was horrible. He gets out right on time. Suddenly, the Bills are good. The Dolphins are good. And uh, Bill's struggling. One and four, having a bad year. Now, I will say, for the Saints' perspective, what a great win for New Orleans. They beat the Patriots 34 to nothing. The New Orleans Saints are now 3-2, and two, which is a big difference from 2-3. and three. So winning was huge for them. Last week, the Saints lost 26-9. to nine, So uh, I thought that they had a great response to that loss after last week. Coming back this week, playing fantastic defense, making a lot of plays on offense. Derek Carr, the Saints quarterback, had two touchdowns, no turnovers. Officially, he had no interceptions. I thought, frankly, Derek Carr should have had an interception where there was a catch along the ground, got ruled incomplete. I was like, ah! That looks like an interception to me, but that's just me. Regardless, though, this was a monumental win for the Saints. Again, the difference between three and two and two and three is huge. And uh, they are now keeping themselves up at pace with the Buccaneers and Atlanta to stay in that race to win the NFC South. Great win for New Orleans. All right. Um, the Miami Dolphins beat the New York Giants 31 to 16. The Giants are now one and four. And I've got a couple notes after watching this game I want to share. Number one, the Dolphins offense is incredible, man. Um, they score so quickly. Like watching this game live, I feel like every time I looked up again, they were already back in the red zone somehow. I'm like, I've been watching the entire time I thought, but I blink and they're back in the red zone on the doorstep of scoring once again. It's crazy, and what's really insane to me is I think you could even argue that Tua Tungvaloa, the Dolphins quarterback, actually had kind of a bad game. He had an ugly interception on the goal line where a defender stepped right in front of a receiver. It wasn't really open. Ball got deflected, taken for a long 101-yard touchdown, uh, pick six. Then later at interception number two, he was throwing a shallow crosser. The ball went high, got picked off. Like Tua actually wasn't great in this football game. And yet he still finished the day 22 for 30 passing at 308 yards, two touchdown passes, two interceptions, like I said, but they're moving the ball like crazy. And rookie running back Devin A-Chan, or A-Chan, his name pronunciation has changed, Devin A-Chan, which will take me some time. I'm used to saying his name from Texas A&M. Uh, their rookie running back has become a huge part of their offense in Miami. He had 11 carries for 151 yards and a touchdown 
Raheem Mostert, their other running back, had 10 carries for 65 yards and a touchdown. Right now, what's crazy about the Dolphins' offense, they're not only, they're obviously the number one offense in football. It's helped partially because they scored 70 points in one game and just ran for yard after yard and threw for a ton of yards, but they're both the number one offense in rushing yards, but also passing yards. They're doing it in two different ways. It's kind of insane. They're just generating crazy video game numbers, and What I love about it, the Dolphins are paying their running backs basically nothing. And truly, I talked about it before the year started. Their philosophy at running back is we're going to take these guys that are more unknown, pay them very little, and build our offense around them. Devin Achan is a, he's less than a million dollars against the salary cap this year. Where Saquon Barkley, who by the way is injured and not playing, is a little over $10 million that he's getting paid this year. Raheem Mostert has a cap hit of $2.1 million this year. So other teams are paying running backs way more money. And Miami's found a way to pay running backs very little and get incredible production out of them. To me, Miami's the ultimate argument for why you should never draft a running back in the first round. Devin Achan, a rookie running back, is killing it. And they're paying him next to nothing. It's great for the Dolphins. Like, they're set. They never needed to give Devin Achan a new contract. They can just ride it out till he's done. And, um, man, I, I, I just think that, unfortunately, it's a great example of why the running back position has no leverage in the NFL. Once again, Tua had kind of a bad game. Miami still won 31-16. to They had over 500 yards of total offense. And we got to talk about Giants quarterback Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones was 14 for 20 passing at 119 yards. No touchdowns, no interceptions, but he was sacked six times on the day. And in the fourth quarter, Daniel Jones left the game with a neck injury. Every time I watched the Giants, whether it was Monday Night Football last week, a couple weeks ago before that, um, on film, today, I'm recording Sunday night. Like Every time I watch the Giants, I just can't help but think to myself, I wonder what Daniel Jones would look like with a good offensive line and a true number one receiver. Uh, get a receiver who could win one-on-one matchups. What would happen with Daniel Jones? I think he might be okay. Like, the best of Daniel Jones, to me, is significantly better than Mac Jones, the Patriots quarterback. And I think Mac Jones, if you put him in the Patriots offense with Mike Gusecki, Hunter Henry, Kendrick Bourne, Devontae Parker, I think Mac Jones would be much better with a solid offensive line they have in New England. I really believe the Giants have, like for all the mistakes Daniel Jones makes, and I'll I'll call him out when he makes a mistake or misses a read or does something that's not good. But I I do have to say, like, I, I just don't think Daniel Jones is being put in a good position to do well. I mean, that offensive line has to be the worst offensive line in the NFL. The constant missed assignments are are crazy. Guys running right by your left tackle, running right by your right tackle. It's like, how is this possible to protect a quarterback this poorly? And, uh, you know, to me, Dave Gettleman's draft picks really still to this day are hurting this team. That 2018 draft class where, remember they drafted Saquon Barkley running back number two overall? That's not what this team needed, man. This team doesn't need a running back. They don't need Saquon Barkley getting... Paid $10 million a year. They Really what they needed was like, they could have drafted Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Quinton Nelson. I mean, I know they had Eli Manning, but imagine if they drafted Josh Allen, who Josh Allen was drafted after Saquon Barkley somehow. Can you imagine? It's just frustrating to me. Like, this roster in New York is so bad. And I think Brian Dable is going to go down with this ship. He's going to get a lot of blame for this year, but... I don't think drafting in recent years really helped the Giants. And I, I just feel feel bad for Brian Dable. Daniel Jones getting thrown to the turf every play. I don't know, man. I, I really, like, I made a, a film analysis video talking about the things that Daniel Jones did poorly on that Monday night game. But there's still a lot of sacks that weren't his fault. And there's a lot of times where even, there was a sack he took where he had a completion. He, he passed it up. He tried to run back the line of scrimmage. But, the right guard got so badly beaten that, like, there's no margin for error. And uh, I don't know, man. This this Giants offensive line can't be overstated. They are 
abysmal. It's so embarrassing and so shameful and so bad. And when you watch an offensive line this horrible, it's hard to just not think to yourself, is it really Daniel Jones' fault? Like, I know I saw the film. I know, but it's like, I just, I can't imagine he might not be better with a decent offensive line. And so I, I just think I'll call out Daniel Jones when it's required, but in all fairness, man, like, I would not want to play on the Giants right now. Like, their, their offensive line is so bad. I don't know how you get anything done. It's killing me. I want to talk about Pittsburgh. The Steelers won a wild game. Baltimore was beating Pittsburgh 10-3 to with 11 minutes left in the fourth quarter. And multiple, like, insane things happened in this fourth quarter. First of all, Pittsburgh got a safety on a blocked punt early in that fourth quarter. So they block a punt, that makes it 10 to 5. Then Pittsburgh gets a field goal, making it 10 to 8. But then the Steelers fumble the punt deep in their own territory. It, it gave Baltimore first and goal after the muffed punt. But then on third and goal, two plays later, Lamar Jackson threw an interception in the end zone to Joey Porter Jr., the Steelers corner. So first of all, Lamar Jackson was on the goal line, couldn't take advantage of it. Then Pittsburgh followed that up with a long touchdown pass to George Pickens with a minute, 17 seconds left. That gave Pittsburgh a 14 to 10 lead. They went for two. They didn't get it. Then the Steelers defense goes out there. They sack Lamar Jackson, who fumbled, and TJ Watt recovered that. Pittsburgh gets another field goal. They win 17 to 10, which I got to say is the weirdest way to 17 points I've ever seen in my life. A field goal, a safety, that's five points. Then a field goal again, that's eight points. Then a touchdown, making it 14 points, but a failed two-point conversion plus a field goal, that's 17 points. That's the weirdest way to 17 I've ever seen. Field goal, field goal, safety, touchdown, field goal. By the way, no extra point, no two-point conversion, wild. And on the final play of the game for Lamar Jackson, fourth and seven for Baltimore, he got sacked by none other than T.J. Watt. I said, I remember this on Friday, Friday's episode. I said, if Pittsburgh's going to win this football game, they need T.J. Watt and their defense to make a really big impact. That is exactly what happened. T.J. Watt and the Steelers defense basically won this game for Pittsburgh. They forced Lamar Jackson, the Ravens quarterback, to have two turnovers in the final six minutes of the fourth quarter. And it's just wild, man. Like, this is, you know, it's a formula that can, formula that can work for Pittsburgh. I, I don't love their quarterback, Kenny Pickett. He's kind of having an ugly year. He's kind of struggling. The nice touchdown was great. It was a, it really relieved the tension in my chest. I've been really worried about the Steelers' offense to watch him throw that touchdown pass to George Pickens. I was like, okay, maybe there's hope here. Maybe there's progress that can happen. But it's not like, other than that touchdown pass, Kenny Pickett didn't do much all game long. But somehow, still, Pittsburgh is 3-2. and two. They're tied with the Ravens for, uh, I guess, the lead, technically, in that AFC North. And uh, really what stands out to me is the Ravens had an opportunity here to secure a lead in the AFC North, make themselves 4-1, and one, and push Pittsburgh down to 2-3, and three, and they couldn't get it done. It's like, man, TJ Watt is incredible. The Ravens kind of choked. And somehow, after having... A really ugly start to the year. Their defense has led the Steelers to 3-2. and two. All right, guys, I got to take another short break. I got to pay the bills. Hey, guys, uh, it's kind of a big deal here. I'm actually trying to help you, so don't skip the ad. I know that when you listen to a podcast, you skip ahead. I know that because that's what I do, but don't skip this one. We got Factor as a sponsor, and I was sitting down to prepare my little ad read. They give, you know, I, I write a piece of paper with a bunch of notes. And I'm like, okay, what are they offering? What's the deal here? Usually it's like 10 to 20%. You're like, okay, factor.com slash SOS, whatever. And uh, no, 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 they are offering 50% off to Strong Opinion Sports listeners. And here's what they are. They are, Factor is a meal kit service. You can get 50% off. Go to factormeals.com slash SOS50 and use code SOS50 and uh, straight up on a human level. If you'd be kind of silly not to investigate, it's a great deal. Factor is a meal kit service. They send you ready-to-eat meals. Uh, they're easy to prepare. For me, they showed up in a box with a bunch of high-quality ice packs. You take them out of the box. You put the, the meal kits in the fridge. And when you want food, you go to the fridge. You take it out. You put the thing in the microwave. You heat it up. Two minutes later, you've got a really good meal ready to go. Now, 
The microwave part made me kind of go, what is this? Is it a bunch of TV dinners? Like, what is this crap? No, no, no. This is phenomenal food. It's high quality. It's never frozen. And compared to all the other options you can have for a quick and easy meal, it kind of kicks booty and is phenomenal. So what I really think is interesting, too, there's so many ways to customize your order, whether you are maybe you're on a diet and you're like, hey, I'm trying to cut calories. There are low calorie options. Or maybe you just want really good food that's easy to make and doesn't take 30 minutes to an hour out of your time cooking during the day. Like for me, I'm really busy with football season and it's an incredibly valuable thing for me to go to my fridge, grab a really good meal, pull it out, put it in the microwave. Two minutes later, I've got a good meal ready to go. I saved a lot of time. It's cheaper for you and better than takeout or delivery. I used to drive for a delivery service. Guys, those prices are not good compared to this. Um, so again, it's just nice to have the fridge loaded with high quality, good meals that are easy to prepare. And you can get 50% off of this meal kit service. Do the math. That's a really good offer. So head to factormeals.com slash SOS50 and use code SOS50 to get 50% off. That is factormeals.com slash SOS50. Use code SOS50 to get 50% off. Again, code SOS50 at factormeals.com slash SOS50 to get 50% off. And uh, guys, it's a great offer. You would be silly. I'm trying to help you. Like that would be a great thing to investigate because it's legitimately a great deal. Food's expensive right now. And having food that's great and convenient and not terrible for you is a rare thing. So investigate it. Factormeals.com slash SOS50. All right, we are back. Um, I got to say, my mouth is like incredibly dry. I don't know what's going on. I'm I'm pushing through, but I feel kind of off right now. I don't know if I'm tired. I've been going all day. I don't know what's happening, but I feel kind of off. Um, let's jump into college football. This past weekend, we had the Red River rivalry game, although technically, I guess it's called the Red River Showdown. Oklahoma beat Texas 34 to 30. And it was a tie game, 27-27, with six minutes to go. I mean, this was an incredible football game. I really, really thoroughly loved it. Probably, of all the games I watched this weekend, college and NFL, Oklahoma-Texas was by far my favorite football game. I watched, I went to Kahuku High School to watch a football game with Joel, came back. So I get to back to my desk at like 9 p.m. Hawaii time, Saturday night. I click on Oklahoma-Texas. I watched it. It was absolutely incredible. Texas led late in this game. They led 30-27, to 27, but Oklahoma got a touchdown with 15 seconds left to take a lead and win 34-30. to 30. I got to just say, this is a monumental, massive win for Oklahoma head coach Brent Venables. He was, remember, Brent, Brent Venables was a longtime Clemson defensive coordinator. His defense was fantastic in this football game. Oklahoma is now 6-0. Texas is 5-1. And, and, uh... I didn't expect this from Oklahoma. I'm not going to lie. You know, Steve Sarkeesian's got this high-powered, really fun offense in Texas. They've got Quinn Ewers at quarterback. Brett Venables is a defense playing in the Big 12. Like, eh, the defense? Come on now. That's not going to make a, a difference here. But Brent Venables' defense delivered, man. Texas had the ball first and goal at the one-yard line. And four plays in a row on the goal line. Oklahoma's defense came up with a really big stop. They got a stop on... I guess what's the word, a goal line stand, holding Texas to no points after a first and goal on the one. Oklahoma's defense forced Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers to have three turnovers in this football game, two interceptions and a fumble. And again, like the matchup that was exciting was Steve Sarkeesian's offense at Texas against Brent Venable's defense at Oklahoma. And Brent Venable's defense was the one that won this matchup. It was really cool. And uh, I just got to give props to Oklahoma. I loved it, man. And we got a write-in from Patreon. SDS4800 writes in and says, Hey, Zach, college football is in full swing, and last Saturday was a great day for it. Minus USC winning, because all of us in Oklahoma, outside of Stillwater, refer to Lincoln Riley as a weasel. But I digress. He says, My question to you is this. What do you think are some of the best college football rivalries that the NCAA has to offer? I'm assuming you may have the Oregon Civil War or the Apple Cup high on the list since you're from the Northwest. Um, SDS4800, I want to give you an answer. I think I'm going to give you the answer you're fishing for. Quite frankly, the college football rivalry game I enjoy the most every year is, in fact, the Red River Showdown. I mean, it's just incredible. I hope it stays the same as both Oklahoma and Texas move on to go to the SEC next year. 
I hope it can stay as epic and legendary as it's always been, but this is the game that gave us the birth of Caleb Williams. Remember, that day where Spencer Rattler got benched at Oklahoma, Caleb Williams comes in as a freshman and destroys Texas and wins. Like, this is a game that is epic every single year. And uh, I think that I, I love Big 12 football games. I loved the Colorado TCU game, which I know Colorado's not a Big 12 member yet, but it felt like a Big 12 game. I like the high scoring, fun games, but man, like, after really the two favorite games I've probably seen all year, college or pro, was week one, Colorado beating TCU, and then here in college football week six, as Oklahoma beat Texas 34 to 30. It was incredible. It was fun. It was back and forth. I had no idea what was going to happen. Whoever had the ball last was going to win. It was incredible. It was just amazing football. And the other rivalries that stand out, like, you know, the Iron Bowl's great, Alabama Auburn. Probably my favorite outside of the Red River Showdown is Michigan Ohio State. That's always fun. I forget what they call it, but there's some some silly name there. Um, I mean, Bedlam's always interesting. I don't know if it's going to be the same as Oklahoma will be a Big Twelve school and or so Oklahoma State's going to be a Big Twelve school and Oklahoma's going to go on to the SEC. But um, Notre Dame USC is always interesting. But to me, like the two best rivalry games in all of college football. There's a lot of great ones, but to me, the ones that I enjoy the most are. Michigan, Ohio State, and Oklahoma, Texas. And this weekend, Oklahoma, Texas really, really delivered. All right. Um, by far the worst loss I saw this past weekend. I want to tell you, Miami had the ball with the lead 20 to 17. They had the ball with 33 seconds left. All they had to do was take a knee. They're in the shotgun. You take a snap. You take a knee. Game over. But instead, for some baffling reason, I will never understand. And I, I actually, I didn't, I didn't do the work of this yet. I should go listen to the Mario Cristobal post-game press conference because I would love to hear his answer to this question. Instead of taking a knee, they ran the ball with their running back who fumbled. That gave Georgia Tech the ball. And then in 25 seconds, Georgia Tech ran, drove 74 yards for the game-winning touchdown. Georgia Tech wins 23-17. And Miami had an opportunity. All they had to do was take a knee and win. And instead, they run the ball for some reason. They fumble, give the ball back to Georgia Tech, who takes it and wins. What is going on in Miami? What's happening? I had an all-time legendary moment. I'm in the car with my friend Joel. We're going to a football game. His little brother, who's a Miami fan, calls him freaking out. Can you believe this? Like, they've got like 100 coaches on the sideline. No one thought to themselves, can we take a knee? Like, you would think that this guy bet... Every penny. He didn't have any money on the game, by the way, but you would think that this kid had bet his house, his wife, his dog, his family, everything he had on this football game. He was irate. He could not believe Miami lost to Georgia Tech in the way that they did. And I don't understand why Mario Cristobal, Miami's head coach, why not have the quarterback take a knee? It doesn't make any sense to me. I, I agree with the outrage. And uh, really kind of the other question I have is why do coaches leave Oregon? Like, Remember, I, I mean, I understand Mario Cristobal went to Miami. He was kind of going back home. You got no state income tax. Being the man in Miami has got to be awesome. I mean, to be a millionaire, be like the face of an organization, whether it's the NBA, baseball, football, college, whatever it is, being the man in Miami has got to be pretty awesome. But, uh, you know, it's another Oregon coach who left Oregon, and they're kind of struggling. I mean, they were actually, they were having a, they were 5-0 and going into this game. So Miami was doing awesome. Their perfect season, it was ruined in like the dumbest way humanly possible. But what I will say, Dan Lanning, the current head coach at Oregon, your life is good, man. You've got a ton of money, great facilities. They're giving you even better facilities in the future. We're going to the Big Ten. I, I don't know that Dan Lanning should leave Oregon ever. <laughs> Dan Lanning... Uh, you got a destination job. We've seen a lot of coaches leave Oregon and not be quite the same. And so if I'm Dan Lanning at Oregon, stay put. Your life is great. You're making a ton of money. No reason to leave Oregon, Dan Lanning. You're good. Don't do what Mario Cristobal just did ever. <laughs> Don't leave Oregon. And for the love of God, 33 seconds left. Your opponent has no timeouts left. Take a knee. Win the football game. It all could have been avoided. I can't believe they ran the ball and fumbled. That's just absurd ridiculousness. I want to give a shout out to LSU. LSU beat Missouri 49 to 39 this past weekend. Um, LSU could not afford to lose this football game. LSU was, um, if they lost, they were three and two. They would have been three and three. 
three and three is really different than what LSU is right now, which is four and two. Missouri is a good win. Missouri was the number 23 ranked team in the country. LSU was ranked number 21. Missouri was five and zero, oh, and uh, I thought this was a tough, really important win that Brian Kelly, the LSU coach, really needed. LSU is now four and two, and just I mean, man, if you lose this football game, three and three is so different than four and two. If you're Brian Kelly to LSU, and uh, I thought, con- you know, controlling the damage is what happened for Brian Kelly and LSU this weekend. But what an important win for Brian Kelly and LSU. I want to end the show with this. Number 10 Notre Dame lost to the 25th ranked team in the nation, Louisville, this past weekend. Louisville beat Notre Dame 33 to 20. And uh, Notre Dame quarterback Sam Hartman threw not one, not even two, but three interceptions in this football game. It's a really tough loss, but here's what I want to remind you guys of. I remember two weeks into the college football season, we saw... Notre Dame go on the road, literally in Ireland. They beat up on Navy 42-3. to Then the following weekend, Notre Dame beats Tennessee State 56-3. to And everybody freaked out. They're like, oh my gosh, it's the best Notre Dame team we've ever seen. They're just like, yes. You know, just doing things that you shouldn't be doing. It's probably a bad impression right there. Um, <laughs> they're, they're going crazy. And it's like, you, you haven't beat anybody. You beat... Navy and Tennessee State. Why are you freaking out? Why are you celebrating? Why are we overreacting here? And I was in no hurry to make a crazy proclamation. I remember what I said. I think uh, I think Rhett wrote in about this. Rhett on Patreon wrote in. He wasn't one of the guys saying we're the best Notre Dame team ever, but he, he had a question asking, like, how good is Notre Dame? And I said, let's wait and find out. I'm in no hurry. We'll just see how the year goes for them. And they've got a couple of big opponents coming up. They got Ohio State, USC, Duke. I don't, think, I don't think I mentioned Duke, but they almost lost to Duke. But now, after six games, Notre Dame is 4-2. and two. They've got a loss to Ohio State and Louisville. Next Saturday, Notre Dame plays USC. You now have your answer. How good is Notre Dame? They're 4-2. and two. And they're not making the college football playoff. They've got a loss to Ohio State. They've got an uglier loss to Louisville. We'll see what happens against USC this weekend. It's in South Bend. The game is at Notre Dame. Um, man, I just, uh, Notre Dame lost again. Their season isn't over, but their chances at a college football playoff are over. And, uh, it's a shame, but this is why I don't understand what people are like four games into a young quarterback's career. He's the best rookie quarterback we've ever seen. Like, so was RG3, wasn't he? Or like four games in or two games into a college football team season. They're like, Best version of this team we've ever seen in our lives. I'm like, just why are we making these early proclamations? I mean, I know why. The answer is because people want attention. They want to get credit for being right. They want to make these early predictions that look insane and are cool and they're right. Um, I play that game a little bit. I don't want to, like, toot my own horn. I mean, there are moments where I make a prediction and I, I tell you what I think. But uh, And I, I hope the people that said that when they thought Notre Dame was the best Notre Dame team they've ever seen, I hope they believed it at the time. But that clearly now is not true. And uh, that's why when you see me kind of dragging my feet to give you really strong predictions on rookie quarterbacks and really strong, like, I'm like, ah, let's just, I'm a guy who, I like to marinate. I like to let things play out a little more before we tell you what we see. And usually by the time I've made up my mind, it's really, really rooted in something with substance. And I can tell you, like, what did Dan Lanning say? Rooted in substance. Rooted, I can't remember the other thing he said. I wish I could remember that. But my point is, like, we don't need to be in such a hurry to make these crazy proclamations about teams or players. And um, I mean, I, I, I will probably in the future make a proclamation and say, I believe this about a player or this team. And you might tell me, Zach, I think it's too early. And I, I believe you, but I want you to know my philosophy is I try to wait. I try to be patient. I do make predictions. I do make these uh, proclamations about, hey, this is how I feel about this. or This is how I feel about that. But I try to wait till I've got a lot of evidence and a lot of opportunities have been given to said team or said organization before I go, man, like I've just never, I don't think I'm the guy who makes calls too early. So I don't know. I want to recap the show today. Remember, um, Cowboys fans, how do you feel about Dak Prescott? Uh, Patriots fans, how do you feel about Bill Belichick? How you feeling Notre Dame fans? How you feeling Miami fans? That's got to be, I'm, if there's any Miami fans listening to this podcast, write into me. Tell me how you feel. 
If you don't follow the Patreon or whatever, send me a message on Instagram. I want to hear from you. I'm just fascinated. How do you feel about that loss at Miami? Because that one was, it was brutal. Um, and then Giants fans, you know, I love you. Giants are my, I'm not a Giants fan. I think I'm a fan of their fan base. Is that weird? Like I, I just really enjoy interacting with New York Giants fans. Giants fans are passionate. They're kind of mean to me sometimes. I don't really care. I own it. I enjoy the, the back and forth and, uh, Giants fans, right in. How do you feel about your loss, thirty-one to sixteen? And, and how do you feel about your quarterback, Daniel Jones? And and then Patriots fans, is it Mac Jones or the offense? I got a lot of questions from this episode, and I I would love to hear from you guys, the audience, how you feel about everything I talked about today, guys. My name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. It's been a long day. I am exhausted. Um, it's very late Sunday night. You'll hear this Monday morning. Hope you have a great day. I love you. And uh, ba dum bum. Bam, we are done.